Microsoft in the 90s, it was crazy. You write software all day, you party all night. Microsoft in the 90s, code, party, code, party. El dinero estable por todas partes. El estacionamiento de Microsoft, uh, Ferrari, Ferrari, Ferrari. I mean, I had an Audi A4, and that was not a cheap car. And I was on Paul Allen's yacht, and Paul Allen pulled me aside, and he said, are we not paying you? And I was like, you know, and he, he gave me a brick of cash. I'll never forget, it was so much cash, I had to hold it with both hands. And he said, come in tomorrow with a Ferrari, or don't bother coming in at all. And that was Microsoft in the 90s. And everybody had a gun. It was crazy. You couldn't walk through the hallway without getting hit by a Nerf dart. You'd be walking through the hallway and hear pop, pop, pop. Foya escrito de mi amigo está viendo de pistolas Nerf. We had this one guy. He had a machine gun. You know, you know the one that cost hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, it was right on his desk. Like como si no fuera nada. Like, like it was nothing. And I asked him, why do you have this kind of gun? And he said. Protection. That was that was Microsoft in the night. The guns, the money, the boats, the cars. We never thought it would end. Until it did. Earlier today, the US Court of Appeals in Washington, DC heard oral arguments in the Microsoft antitrust case. And the party stopped. The head of the Department of Justice team was this lawyer named David Boyes. And uh, he was a very powerful guy. He knew a lot of powerful people, and I mean nobody, nobody wanted to go up against this guy. David Boyce, el abogado federal, el boro sabe más que tú. David Boyce, just saying that name makes me mad. So we knew we were in trouble. Uh, if the antitrust suit succeeded, we were really going to be at a disadvantage in the marketplace. So we couldn't win the browser wars, maybe we could win the coming application wars on the web. And that's when we invented Next Generation Windows Services. And even Steve Ballmer thought that was a horrible name. And I was like, well, it runs on the net and it uses .NET domains, so maybe we call it .NET. And that's how we got .NET. So now we have a plan, and uh, the core advantage of .NET was automatic garbage collection. See, back then you had to manually allocate and deallocate memory. So at the time I was head of applications testing, and they called me Madres de los Probadores, which uh, translates as uh, Mother of the Testers. And uh, the biggest problem we had was memory leakage. Guys would, guys would allocate memory and then forget to free it. So .NET was a real opportunity with this with this uh, automatic memory management because a lot of guys, they got fired when their software didn't work correctly. Solo otro idioma importante en ese momento tenía recolección de basura, Java. Java was a game changer. Uh, at the time it was owned by Sun Microsystems and Scott McNally ran the company. And uh, Scott wanted the garbage collector to be totally customized. So Anders Heilsberg, he was the lead architect of .NET at the time. And uh, he wanted it totally automatic, the black box. It should just work. And the less we published about it, the less a prosecutor like David Boyes could use to incriminate us. So we never really explained to programmers how it worked. And even if a programmer knows, he'll never explain it. He's, he's too afraid. Nunca encontrara a nadie que la explique la recolección de basura. Nunca. Garbage collection? I don't want to talk about that. You're not going to find anyone who'll talk about that. I won't, I won't talk about that. I'm done. Do I, do I look at, do I look at you? I look at you? Yeah, if you could just tell me your name and your occupation. Uh, my name's Ryan Beth. I'm a software architect and uh, I know how garbage collection works. Now you're probably gonna start getting interview questions about how the .NET garbage collector works right when you start transitioning to your mid and senior level roles. Now here's another thing. You can go your whole career and never really learn how the garbage collector works because 99% of the time it really doesn't matter.
I didn't know how the garbage collector worked until like 2012 when I started interviewing for senior positions and I was asked how the garbage collector worked and I didn't know how to answer them. So that really motivated me to learn how the garbage collector works in .NET. Now, before I start, feel free to like and subscribe. Uh, you're welcome to connect with me on Twitter or on LinkedIn. And as always, the code for this and the PowerPoint is going to be available down here at my website or my GitHub. Now you probably already know this, but there's two types of memory in .NET, the stack and the heap. On a 64-bit system, the stack is limited to four megabytes. The heap is theoretically unlimited. Really, it's limited to your system memory. The stack holds value types like integer, float, bool. The heap holds reference types like object, array, and string. Now, not a lot of people know this, but the heap is divided as well into the small object heap and the large object heap. The small object heap contains uh, anything that's below 85K. The large object heap contains stuff that's above 85K. Usually the stuff in the large object heap are things like arrays. Now, when you create an object, a reference in the stack points to the actual object that's stored in the heap. And when a variable goes out of scope and is no longer in use, the memory becomes eligible for collection. The garbage collector will mark all of the live references then it will relocate those references and compact the live memory, overwriting the old dead objects. Now, the large object heap isn't typically compacted. It would just take too long and cost too many resources to compact all this information. But instead, what it does is it uses a free data table. And this free data table gives a range of free memory locations. That way, if more data comes in, it can slot it in the appropriate place. And once something is released, the table is updated. And it lets .NET know, hey, you can stick something else in this location. Now, as of .NET 4.5.1, there is a way to compact the large object heap. Now, when the garbage collector runs, all other worker threads stop except for the garbage collector thread. And that's why you're never going to see .NET on any real-time systems like aircraft or weapon systems. You just can't stop processing real-time system data in order to compact memory. So if compacting objects is this really resource intensive process, what if we help reduce some of that risk by estimating what objects need to be collected? You know, that way we're not checking live objects every time we run the garbage collector. And .NET does that with generations. Now all objects in the small object heap start out in generation zero. Now if they survive a garbage collection, they get promoted to generation one. This doesn't happen that often. Usually objects in generation zero are very short-lived. Now objects in generation one aren't looked at by the garbage collector as frequently as objects in generation zero. In fact, the objects in generation one might not be looked at at all unless there's no more room in generation zero. So what happens when we try to garbage collect generation one? Well, when we garbage collect generation one, everything generation one and below get collected. It's called a partial collection then everything in generation one becomes generation two. And everything in generation zero becomes generation one. Now, by the time you're in generation two, you're probably gonna last the life of the application. So the garbage collector doesn't look at generation two all that much. Now, when the garbage collector does get around to collecting generation two, it's gonna collect everything in generation two, everything in generation one, everything in generation zero, and everything in the large object heap. It's called a full collection. So when is the garbage collector actually called? Well, there's three ways to do it. The first is when the system says, hey, I'm low on memory. The second is when a generation reaches a certain memory threshold. And the third is when you tell it to using this method. Now, calling this method really isn't something you should ever do. The garbage collector usually knows best when to collect garbage. But the Seymours of the world love to ask this question. When would you call the garbage collector manually? <laughs> okay, so the real answer is never, right? But um, maybe I would run the garbage collector manually if I knew I was going to create a large object that was going to go straight into the uh, large object heap or straight into generation two. Like, let's say I'm, I'm editing a, a 1.5 gigabyte file. I'm editing a huge file, and I just finished editing another large file. Maybe when I open that selection box window to, to select the new file, 
in the background, I can fire off the garbage collector because it's going to take a human a couple of seconds to find the file they want. And, and that might buy me some time and they might not notice that the system halted collecting garbage. But in reality, I probably wouldn't do it. Okay, so to recap, you have the stack and the heap. The heap is split up into the small object heap and the large object heap, with the small object heap getting everything below 85k. All objects start at generation zero, and they'll probably die there too. If they survive the first collection, they'll go to generation one. If they survive that collection, they'll go to generation two. Whenever you collect a generation of garbage, you collect everything below that generation of garbage. Objects in the large object heap are not compacted. Instead, a free memory table is used to determine what space is free and what space is being used. Although in current versions of .NET, you can compact it if you want. And finally, the garbage collector is triggered when system resources are low, a generation is getting too big, or you tell the garbage collector to run. Good luck on your next interview. Nunca encontrará, nunca encontrará, ne, nunca, nunca encontrará la nadie, nunca encontrará.